In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Well, as promised, here we are in the fall, the common time for churches to talk about stewardship. Not the favorite topic of most churches, but a necessary one. And necessary for reasons other than what you might think. Stewardship, of course, as you've heard me say a hundred times, and I'll say it a hundred more, is usually framed in most church discussions as a sermon on the amount. <laughs> where stewardship is about dollars and cents. It's about funding a budget. It's about meeting goals. It's about keeping lights on. And that is a horrid, awful mistake. That's not stewardship at all. That is a fruit of stewardship. That is a result of good stewardship. But so often we think, okay, good stewardship happens when the money's good, everything's kept up very well. It's the other way around. It's the, if there is good stewardship, then everything else will fall into place. So what do I mean by stewardship in this sense? Every year I try and talk about stewardship a little bit differently. Uh, and this year, I don't want to talk about stewardship in terms of dollars and cents, in terms of budgets and bottom lines, but in terms of creation and priesthood. Now, how on earth am I going to do that? Stay tuned and you will find out. <laughs> stewardship is rooted not in need. It's not rooted in necessity at all. Stewardship is rooted in creation itself. Creation itself. That's to say that stewardship is part of the very fabric of creation. So it didn't just come around with us, but as long as there has been creation, there has always been built into it this concept of stewardship. Let me expand on it a little bit. The Genesis, the book of Genesis, the first two chapters especially, contain our creation story. The story of our creation. And there's an interesting thing about that creation story. When the book of Genesis was written, there were a bunch of other creation stories floating around from different cultures and peoples of the same time. The Babylonians had one. Uh, the Egyptians had one. The, all these different peoples had their own creation accounts. And our Genesis story doesn't look anything like theirs. It's totally different. There, there's not really any similarity between Genesis and these other creation accounts. But what Genesis does have similarity to is these other nations' accounts of temple building. Isn't that interesting? When you read the story of the creation and dedication of a Babylonian temple or of an Egyptian temple, it reads a whole lot like Genesis 1 and 2. Now, I'm not saying that Genesis 1 and 2 means God created this world as a Babylonian temple or an Egyptian temple, but what it does mean is that it says something about the reason God created in the first place. Why did God create in the first place? Creation didn't just happen, and then God came along to give it some meaning. If we believe, as we do as Christians, that God is the creator of heaven and earth, then there must be some purpose. There must be some vocation, some calling built into creation itself. And what Genesis tells us is that the world was primarily created for worship. The world was created as a temple in which God himself would dwell. Now this is something difficult for us to understand because we modern people tend to live in what might be called a two-story universe. The two-story universe where we live down here on the first floor among all the ordinary stuff and God lives up there. And if you doubt that, then think of how many times you've either said or heard the man upstairs referring to God. The man upstairs. Sort of like the elderly uncle who never comes out of his room, but is there. The man upstairs. There's a distance there. 
right? Now, there's some accessibility. I can always go, you know, call upstairs if I need to, or I guess text now. I can always communicate, okay, if I need something from the guy upstairs. But I'm really doing, I'm pretty okay down in this first floor. Got it under control. And if I need him, he's up there. And so, you know, I know he's up there, but if he wants to come do something special, that's cool, but he really doesn't need to. He could just stay right there. Now, we might not explicitly believe that, but for many of us, that is the way we live our lives. We live our lives as, as if every encounter with God were some sort of meeting between the, the upstairs and the downstairs. Maybe at the halfway point of the stairs. Who knows? But the story that the Bible gives us is not of a downstairs earth and an upstairs heaven. Rather, heaven and earth in Scripture constantly overlap. There is a, a, a permeability between the two of them. Heaven and earth are not as starkly separated as we tend to make them out to be. Why is this important for the creation? It's important because it's not as if God in his great heaven, as Robert Browning said, God is in his heaven, all is well with the world. And he created this world and then sort of left it to its own devices. Now many people believe that. Many very famous and influential people, like Thomas Jefferson. But he didn't believe the Bible. Because what the Bible teaches in that regard is that God didn't just create the world and depart off to some far-off heaven. But rather, when God created the heavens and the earth, he created them as something of a cosmic temple. What did the ancients believe about temples? They didn't just believe they were places you went to worship. They believed that in a special sense, God lived there. God was present there. When you wanted to meet God, you didn't have to go upstairs. You went to the temple because that's where God was. And so the Genesis creation account reads like the account of a temple being set up. Now, we might say, how vain is that for God to build a temple for himself? Well, if there wasn't anybody to build it before he created mankind. And the building of this temple was not some act of vanity on God's part. It was an act of love. Because for one thing, creation is an act of love itself. Creation is an act of love. And God created this world to be a temple, not just of worship, but a temple of communion and fellowship with him. He created the world and everything within it to be an expression of his glory and a means of grace to experience him and his love. And he created mankind, male and female, to serve a very special role in that creation. The animal lovers don't like me for saying this, but God did indeed create men and women in the image of God and set them over all the rest of creation. Why? Because he had a special servant vocation for them. If creation is a temple, then man and woman in the creation are to serve as its rulers and priests. Rulers and priests. That was the original vocation of Adam and Eve in the garden. Rule, well, that's pretty easy. Ruling means having dominion over, governing. And that was what Adam and Eve were meant to be in the world. But, but that priesthood is a little bit different, right? How, how on earth were they priests? Did they wear vestments like this? Did they stand behind an altar? Did they wrap it on behind a pulpit to a captive audience? I mean, what, uh, what made them priests? We have to think for a minute, what is a priest and what does a priest do? Take my own vocation, for instance. There is only one thing that I do that is utterly unique to my vocation as a priest per se. Any one of you could come stand in the pulpit and preach. Any one of you could teach the Bible studies or the Sunday school classes. Any one of you could sit down with a hurting person and, and counsel them and pray for them and care for them. I mean, all of us can, can do that. My job takes place at that altar to celebrate the Eucharist. And what is the Eucharist? The Eucharist is a sacrifice. 
It's not just a sacrifice. It's the sacrifice. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, which happened at one point in history, but made present time and time again on the altar. A priest is someone who offers sacrifice. Not just in our Judeo-Christian tradition, but also in the ancient religious traditions uh, in other parts of the world. What a priest does, ultimately, is offers sacrifice. Teaching, instruction, counsel, all those other things can be farmed out. But a priest is one who offers. One who offers sacrifice. And all sacrifice is, is taking a portion of that which is ours and offering it up to God in recognition that it was his in the first place. In recognition that it was his in the first place. And in gratitude for the fact that he gave it to us. That's priesthood. Now in other cultures, sacrifices and offerings were made to God to fulfill that God's needs. Well, we give God food and drink offerings. Why? Well, because you must be hungry or thirsty being in God. But the Hebrews, our forebears in the faith, did not offer God sacrifice that way. They did not offer sacrifice to God as if he needed anything. They did not offer sacrifice to God to fill a lack in him. They offered sacrifice to God as an act of worship and as an act of recognition that all of this was his anyway. They weren't being polite and sharing their stuff with God. They were saying, God, here is the best of what I have offered back to you in thanksgiving because I know it comes from you anyway. That's what a priest does. So sacrifice doesn't just mean animals. The Bible talks about all kinds of different sacrifice. A sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. A sacrifice of righteousness. Bread and wine offerings, grain offerings, all kinds of things. The essence of sacrifice is offering, giving to God. And that's what the essence of worship is. So this world was created as a temple of worship to the one true God who lives and dwells within it. And the priests of that temple, those responsible for actively gathering up that creation and offering it back up to God, are human beings. Birds do not sing their song because they want to praise God. They sing their song because that's what birds do. Dogs do not bark their praises to God, if you could call it such, because they want to praise God. They bark because they're dogs, and dogs bark. We worship and praise God out of a willing heart and a thinking mind. We and we alone among the creatures are able to do that. And that's what gives us our priestly calling. So what does any of this have to do with this topic of, of stewardship? Well, creation is a temple. It's given to us by God for our good and for his glory. We are given the task of, of being priests, if you will, of that creation. That should lead us to break down the walls of separation that we have in the various compartments of our life. Well, this is part of my religious or spiritual life, but it's pretty airtightly sealed from everything else. You know, my work life, my family life, my recreational life. All of these things, they have their own life, but I've got my religious life over here. No, the whole world and all that is in it is charged with the grandeur of God's glory, as Gerard Manley Hopkins wrote. It is charged with the grandeur of God because it is his handiwork, and we, created in his image, are called to rule and serve it in union with him. So stewardship, first of all, begins with the recognition that nothing that is ours is really ours at the end of the day. Now, if you worked really hard for what you have, that might make you mad. And if so, I'm sorry. But I think that I have Holy Scripture on my side on this. We say those words whenever we bring the offering up. All things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own have we given thee. If we thought the other way, then it would be easy 
be easy for us to be very generous in our giving and pat ourselves on the back for being so kind to share what we have with God. Stewardship begins with the firm conviction of mind that everything we have to begin with is God's. And not just our own personal stuff, but this whole world. It's God's. It's all His. And it's all been given to us as a gift. It's all been given to us as a sacred trust. And it's all been given to us as a means to worship Him. All of it. Our work, our gifts and talents, our families, our friends, nature, everything. It's all a temple. It's all a temple, and God is not just up there. Now, God's not in the trees or the grass or anything, but He's among them because He created them. And the seventh day, God resting after the creation was not just God taking a nap on the couch after creation because He was tired. If you read the accounts of the building of the Jerusalem temple, what do the people pray as soon as they've dedicated the last piece? Of furniture. Oh God, come into your resting place. To rest in that biblical sense wasn't just to sleep or take it easy, it just meant to be and to dwell. So when God rested after the seventh day, he was just dwelling in his creation and being God. That's the definition of what a temple is. And all the stuff in the Bible about the Jewish people making a temple. That was a microcosm of what God intended the whole world to be. And when the Bible calls the the Israelites, and later on the Christians, a royal priesthood, a kingdom of priests to serve God, that's what it's talking about. Those who worship God by offering up to Him that which is His. So that's the, the general concept here about stewardship as a function of creation and priesthood. So I hope that that we can think differently about both, about creation and about priesthood and our vocation there. Because the fact is, there's not just one priest in this room standing behind a pulpit, but rather we are, all of us, gathered together a priestly people with a priestly vocation and a priestly identity built into us, given to us in our baptism. And the reason for that is because we are baptized into the one true priest, Jesus Christ, our great high priest. Jesus Christ, the one who is both the sacrificial victim and the sacrificing priest, has joined us to him so that we are his body, we are his building, we are his temple. And we are his priests serving in that temple, sharing in his priesthood. And we express that priesthood first and foremost by worship. And worship is first and foremost offering. Offering our sacrifices of praise, of thanksgiving, of time, of talent, of treasure, of all of these things. And so what I ask us to do as we continue this series, if you will, on stewardship is... Let the thinking about the amount, the Sermon on the Amount, the budget, the numbers, the lights, all of those things, which are important, but they are important in their place. They actually lose their importance if you take them out of their place. They lose their importance if you try and give them too much. But rather think first about stewardship as an exercise of your priesthood in Jesus Christ. And take stock of your life in every way, shape, or form. Time, talent, and treasure. And ask, what kind of expression is this of the priestly task that I've been given in God's creation? And think mostly upon the one who shows us what it truly means to be a ruler and a priest. Our Lord Jesus Christ, who not only offered of himself, but offered himself for us and for our salvation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen.